So let's practice on this one. Go ahead and turn to 2 Corinthians <clears throat> chapter 1. Okay, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as our sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounds through Christ. Now if we're afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effective for the enduring the same sufferings which we also suffer. Or if we're comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. And our hope for you is steadfast, because we know that as you are partakers of the sufferings, so also you will, you will partake of the consolation. <clears throat> if you make a simple observation, you see there's a couple words repeated over and over and over again. <laughs> comfort and suffering. I think he says comfort. How many Between comfort and consolation, I mean, it's like nine times in those seven verses. Like nine or ten times or something like that. Suffering and tribulation, he's just hitting that over and over and over again in those seven verses. So if you slow down enough to read, you can say, well, wait a second, this must be a theme that Paul's talking about here. And if we can slow down enough, now this is not going to come out in this text so much, but if you slow down when you're reading 2 Corinthians, and this is, comes out more, it's tough in the epistles, because the epistles are just reading a letter. But... If you can understand the historical context that surrounds the letter, or sometimes if you just read between the lines, put yourself into the position of Paul. If he's writing to a group of people that he knows very well, he probably knows the Corinthians more than he knows any other church that he writes to, and he's right out of the gate talking about being comforted and suffering. When we're suffering, God comforts us. If we're in tribulation, we're in suffering. What can you probably infer is going on with the Corinthians? They're suffering. They're probably suffering. Some kind. We might not know what, but you can read between the lines and ask those sorts of questions. A classic example of this is, and, and, um, and, and we'll reference this passage, I think in this lesson, I think I included it in here. <clears throat> in James chapter 2, very confusing passage. A lot of pre-understanding and presuppositions going to interpret how to interpret that passage in James. But there's one part in particular <clears throat> where James includes what's called a diatribe. We'll talk about this in, later when it comes to interpreting different stuff in different genres. But he includes a diatribe, which is a literary device that an author will use. It's a way of saying, imagine if somebody says, you know what, Joe Biden, he's a great guy, and he's really s smart and can speak eloquently. You know, just like, and then I say, you're an idiot if you think that. What I've just done is I've introduced a diatribe into my teaching. It's a fictional person who says something that I object to, so then I can beat up on that fictional person. And James does that. He says, somebody may well say, you have faith and I have works. And he introduces this person who's saying something. And at the end of it, he says, Are you willing to understand, you foolish, idiot, moron, that faith without works is dead? Now, whenever I teach that, I always say, Okay, let's read between the lines. Because what James is saying is, try is confusing. But if, Stephanie, if you were to walk in here, and me and TJ are having an argument, a theological argument, and all you hear of the conversation is me saying, TJ, you idiot, do you want proof that faith without works is dead? You wouldn't have to have heard a thing that TJ said to know what he was arguing, right? You would be able to know, well, TJ must be saying, faith without works is good, or faith without works is acceptable, or faith without, because Dennis is countering with that, with that, you idiot, why, how could you believe you know, X, Y, and Z. So, same thing. If someone walks in and I say, Don, how dumb are you? Queen is the worst band that has ever exist. You know, you wouldn't have to have been here to know, wait, Don really likes Queen? Like, you just can infer that. But you have to slow down enough to observe who's talking, tone maybe, what's being said. 
and, and ask the question of the text. So these are things that come about when you observe. So when you read that passage in Corinthians, wow, they must be suffering. And Paul must be trying to comfort them um, <clears throat> in their suffering. So we're just fact gathering at this stage. So word studies are a helpful tool in accurate observing. Um, what time are we at? My phone doesn't tell the time. Okay. So when we're doing word studies, again, this is probably not going to break into this when you're just casually sitting down for a devotional time with God's word. But when you're really wanting to understand, doing a word study <clears throat> is very important. Just taking a specific word. I don't know what this word means. I don't know what it means in English. I certainly don't know what it meant in Greek or Hebrew or anything. We have to understand that there is such a thing called a semantic range of a word. An example I like to give is fair. If I was to say, um, you know, this past August, I mean, they canceled it because of Corona, but had they not, this last August I went to a fair and I was walking around and I saw this fair girl and she uh, cheated at this carny game and she didn't play fair. I've just used the word fair, same word, same spelling, three different ways. Same thing with trunk. If I was to say, <clears throat> hey Gavin, take this, whatever, pencil and go put it in the trunk. Okay, I probably mean the trunk of my car, but I could mean there's a hollow carved out in the trunk of that tree out there, or maybe there's an elephant and it's gonna shove it up its nose in its trunk, you know. Again, and the same thing, more importantly, it's the word save in the Bible. The word save has a semantic range. So, um, I won't bring it up. I was going to bring it up on here. Um, maybe I will, just, just so we can see. Um, I want to kind of promote this <coughs> um, website. Um, and this may or may not be helpful if you can't necessarily remember this. But um, blueletterbible.org is, is a really good resource. So if I pull up James chapter 2. And I go down to verse 14. What doth it, doth it profit, this is King James, my brethren, though a man say he have faith and have not works, can faith save him? And you don't necessarily have to remember all this, but you can click on tools and it will give you every Greek word along here that's used in this passage. And I can go down to the word save is the Greek word sozo. And I can pull that up and it will tell me all of the, the different meanings of the word sozo. Now what's interesting though, to illustrate this, is if I go to James chapter 5, and this doesn't come across too much in other translations, but in the King James it does. Um, if any of you are sick, um, call the elders, they'll pray, anoint him over him. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick person. It's the Greek word sozo. It's the same exact word. So are we really suggesting that Paul, or James rather, is talking about salvation from hell in James chapter 2? And in James chapter 5, he's also talking about salvation from hell because he's using the same word, right? No, he's talking about healing, like a physical healing uh, that can come. So that's part of the semantic range of save, to deliver somebody. You're delivering them from the illness. When Jesus heals people in the gospel, he uses it a lot. Your faith has made you well. And our translations typically don't translate it save because they know that'll confuse people. Well, save? We mean save, save from hell. What's he talking about? He just means made you well. That's just a question that we have to ask. What is the context of that word? Same thing when I say, hey, go put this in the trunk, or I went to the fair. Or she cheated and she wasn't playing fair. The context is what tells us, what does he mean by that? You typically, if we're well-versed in the language, you don't even have to know any of the definitions. You can just, the way they use the word, infer what I mean by the, by the word. So we, we talked about this last week. 
if Paul uses a word like the law in Galatians chapter 5, well, what's he talking about? The Greek word is namos. What is the semantic range of that? And how is Paul using it here? Well, how does Paul use it in the rest of Galatians? Is he consistent in the rest of that context? And in Paul's letters, is he consistently using it a certain way? And you can just kind of broaden out what does the word namas mean in all of Scripture. But there are certain errors that crop up um, <clears throat> when we try to do word studies. The English only error is believing that um, well, I'm reading in English. So whatever this means in English, that's what it means. And we have to understand that the Bible wasn't written in English. Now I'll give you a very um, obvious example of this that I'm shocked that somebody so well educated would make this mistake. But he talks about uh, Jordan Peterson in one of the lectures I heard him make uh, give. He said when he talked about Jesus, the son of God, is just like it's analogous of the sun rising in the sky because Jesus is the son of God. I'm like, that doesn't make any sense. The Bible wasn't written in English. So while that pun exists in English, son, S-O-N and S-U-N, that doesn't exist in the original language. So sometimes when we do word studies, what does this mean? <clears throat> um, we have to understand it wasn't written in English. Uh, a time frame error that words change meaning over time. Um, Man, I wish Henrietta was here. I'd have her give, give, give me an old uh, Shakespearean word or something like that. But we, we know this just from King James. Sometimes a lot of us are like, I don't, I don't read the King James because it says things that I don't even understand what it's talking about. So we need an updated version. Same thing is true in, the, in, in a foreign language from 2,000 years ago. If we look at what when Paul said the word authentine, which crops up in, in 1 Timothy chapter 2, this Greek word authentine, it meant something hundreds of years before the time of Paul. It meant something different at the time of Paul, and, and, and words change meaning. So if we just look up and say, oh, this is what the word means. Well, did it mean that when Paul wrote or James wrote? The overload error is assuming that all of the semantic range applies to a word. When I say I went to a fair, I don't mean, you know, like a fair girl or cheating in that plain fair. Words mean a specific, unless you're making a pun, unless you're, doing a play on words or something where a word might have multiple. And that stuff does exist in, a, in the ancient world, just like it exists in English. Um, it's harder to detect, but um, again, the context determines. Uh, word count error. Um, this is just summed up. If, if the word sozo meant this definition seven times, then, it, then it's going to have to mean it this eighth time when it appears. Not necessarily. Again, going back to the example, if I say, yeah, I went to the Shiawassee County Fair, and man, I just love the fair. And uh, it, well, the, re the reason I love the fair is because there's rides and stuff. And, you know, what's your favorite ride at the fair? And uh, wh What games do you like to play at the fair? So I've used the word fair five, six times, and I'm meeting at the same time. And, and then if I say, well, Don, I don't really like that game because people always cheat at it and they don't play fair. I didn't use the same word this, that last time, even though I'd used it half a dozen times one way. I've changed the meaning again. So we can't just look at it and say, well, sozo typically means, you know, seven out of ten times it means to save somebody from hell. So it may not mean it that way all the time. And so we have to understand the context. And then differing authors error. People are different. People speak differently. People use different syntax and different grammar and different nomenclature and different language and different verbiage. When, when we have to make room for that. And um, <clears throat> again, when talking with, uh, I'm gonna pick on Nick Richardson again, but in talking with him, we've been going back and forth on what James chapter two, again, it's a very problem passage where James talks about, can faith save him? And we're justified by works, not by faith alone. And that's really hangs up a lot of people. And Nick is like, oh man, could it mean this? Could it mean this? Could it mean this? Could it mean this? <laughs> And I've already told him, Nick, this is what I think it means. I think James is different than Paul. James is writing a decade and a half before Paul. He's not using the word justified and saved the same way that Paul does. That's what I think the major problem is. If we understand that he's using those words differently, there's not much of a problem in interpreting that passage. So <clears throat> we use different words different ways. 
we have to understand that the authors are different. Let's breeze through this. What Bible's best? Kind of put a little subconscious. Yeah, the Net Bible. Slid that in there. No, just, um, I, I like the Net Bible, but um, whatever. Um, not all Bibles are created equally. So, um, and this does sometimes come down to preference, but um, we do have to understand that the translation that we're reading Translation is the first step of interpretation. When we're reading the ESV rather than the NASB, rather than the King James, whatever, different teams of people translated those different versions. And when they, just like if I was to read Spanish and I'm translating a word in Spanish, like the word fair or the word save, Spanish has words like that that have different semantic ranges. When I translate that into English, I might have to make a deciding factor. What, what did the original author mean here? Did he mean this or did he mean this? Well, I think he meant this. So I'm going to translate it that way to reflect that. Well, once you've done that, you've already kind of interpreted for the reader what you think that that word or that passage might mean. <clears throat> um, I, and I won't uh, read this, but I'll give the example. In Ephesians 4, 11 through 12, in the Net Bible and most other modern translations, it says God has given some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, some as pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry. The King James Version has chosen to translate that evangelists, prophets, uh, apostles, pastors, teachers for the work of ministry, comma, to equip the saints, comma, to, and then these other things. They've made a decision for you in translating that, that the leadership's job is to equip the saints and to do ministry. Other translations say, no, it's the leadership's job to equip the saints to do the work of ministry. So even in that, so you get just a subtle thing like that, they've made an interpretive decision for you. Um, so textual criticism and its effect on translations. Textual criticism is not like you're criticizing the text, like, oh, I hate the Bible or I hate this verse or whatever. It's, it's like a critical eye towards the different text of the Bible. Um, the Bible has what are called different families, manuscript families. And, you know, obviously we don't have access to the actual letter that Paul wrote to Galatians. The, the autographs is what they're called. Those don't exist anymore. We don't have a single piece of paper that Paul put ink to and wrote. <clears throat> um, what we have are copies. And this is important to note, too. People will often say, well, the Bible's been translated so many times, we can't possibly know what it means. You can stop them and say, no, it hasn't been translated a lot of times. It's been copied a lot of times, but it's only been translated once. It's been translated from Greek into English and the Old Testament Hebrew into English. That's only one translation. And it's no more difficult than translating Crime and Punishment by Fyodor Dostoevsky from Russian into English. It's just one translation from one language to another. It has been copied a lot, though. And that's where different manuscript families come in. Imagine this is how they would have copied the Bible and transmitted the Bible in the ancient world because they didn't have the printing press. They had copyists who would write by hand. They would have a room full like this, probably you know, much, much more people than this, in a much, much more formal setting with no distractions. It was very professional. Some really hardcore Jewish ones would, every time that they came to the Word of God, they would stop, go through a ritual cleansing, write the name of God, stop, do a ritual cleansing, and come back and write again. So it was like very rigid. But what they would have is sometimes a person up front dictating the Bible with everyone in the room copying it, hand by hand. And again, depending on the rigidity of it, they would say, okay, we finished this portion of Genesis, Count back from the first word to the middle word in the text and count backwards from the middle word to the middle of the text. What word do you have as that word? You know, 500 words from the beginning, 500 words from the end. I have the word Nick. I'm sorry, you've made a mistake somewhere. Discard that. you got to start over. So they were very rigid in how they copied it. It wasn't just, you know, sitting down writing nonchalantly. But it was humans, and humans do make errors. But the way manuscript families work is if Don made an error and he said, the dog ate my homework, and he's like, dog, what are we talking about dogs? We're translating the Bible. What, they, what he probably meant is God. The God ate my homework. And Don includes that 
change, which is now an error. Everyone else in the room puts the dog ate my homework, but Don puts the God ate my homework. Then everyone who then copies from Don's manuscript is going to include that error. The God ate my homework, but everyone who copied from our manuscripts is going to have the right translation. So those then create manuscript families. And we have hundreds and hundreds of manuscripts because it's been copied so much. We know if I'm looking at this variant, this change in the manuscripts, I know that it probably came from the Don Powell school of Bible school or from Bible translations or Bible copying from Alexandria, Egypt, because all of the manuscripts that have that error all come from the same part of the world and from the, all the same time frame. We can safely assume that all of those manuscripts may be accurate everywhere else, but they're inaccurate in this one area. So we're going to include the correct one that's in, reflected in all these other manuscripts. So when people sit down to copy the Bible, they have thousands of different manuscripts and manuscript families to choose from. And they have to make judgment calls. We think that's why when you read in your Bible, sometimes it'll have small little letterings. Some manuscripts say this. It's because they're letting you know, hey, there is a copyist error here. We're just being fair and letting you know. But they have to make judgment calls <coughs> on which families to use. And then there's word for word versus thought for thought translations. Um, no Bible can be word for word. If you tried to translate literally word for word and word order from word order from Hebrew or Greek to English, it would be nonsensical. I mean, the English words would make sense, but it would say something like, the water dog ate food with bowl. And I'm just like, that doesn't make any sense because English structures itself differently. So they have to change words and add in words to make things flow. So you can't really have a word for word, but the closest you can get is NASB is pretty good. That's why it's sometimes a little bit choppier. If you ever tried to memorize from the NASB, it's kind of choppy. It doesn't really always flow very nicely because they're trying to be as close as they can. Thought for thought is more where you start to get into interpretation. You've got a Bible translator saying, okay, I think I know what Paul meant here. I'm going to say it in such a way that's easier for an English reader to understand. So that's fine to do. But the more you do that, you might make a mistake in your interpretation. Well, guess what? Now you've just then enforced that interpretation onto classic examples, the NIV translating the word flesh to sin nature causes everyone to think, oh, there's such a thing as a sin nature. Well, no, that's not what the word flesh means, but the NIV translators chose to translate it that way. So thought for thought is okay, but you'll start to see in here the NIV, the Holman Christian, which is I kind of like, it falls into this range. And then you start to get into just straight up paraphrases, which is like the New Living Translation, which I tend to like. Way over on the end is the message. If you've ever read the message, it's like barely even the Bible at that point anymore. It's, it's just a dude's commentary on it. But, um, <laughs> um, and I will read, um, I will show this, and we'll end with this. <clears throat> James 2.14 in the King James, just so you can see how bizarrely different this becomes. King James 2.14, what does it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works? Can faith save him? If you change to the NIV, which is kind of a middle of the road, thought for thought. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? They've included the word such, which did not exist in the original language, but they've included it because they think he's talking about different kinds of faith, faith that has works and faith that doesn't have works. So they've made an interpretive decision in there. And then if you look at the message, which I don't even know if they've got the message on here. <coughs> they might not. Um... The message, just to illustrate, I mean, I like picking on the message because it's so, so, um, so bad. <laughs> it's all right for some narrative stuff, but. <clears throat> Dear friends, do you think you'll get anywhere in this if you learn all the right words but never do anything? Does merely talking about faith indicate that a person really has it? I mean, that's completely different. Yeah, that's really 
<laughs> right. That's not what it's saying at all. He, like, Eugene Peterson, the creator of the message, has made a lot of interpretive decisions for us in there. So um, we can kind of end there. I don't think I had anything else on that slide that was of note. Let me breeze through it really quick. Yeah, if you want to do serious studies of the Bible, you want to stick to things that are more on that end of things, the word for word. <clears throat> New King James is pretty good. It softens the archaic language of the King James, but staying pretty faithful. Net, NASB, ESV. Although even in this ESV, the translators are more Calvinistic, so you'll get a lot more of that interpretation in there. Um, casual reading, though, NIV, NLT, Holman Christian, those are safe, but when you really want to seriously study the Bible, you want to try to get as much what does the text say, not what does the person who translated or the NLT say. While Faith and Focus is a ministry of in faith, the views and opinions expressed in this podcast don't necessarily reflect the views and opinions of in faith as a mission. If you like what you heard on this episode, why don't you become a monthly supporter of the ministry? It really helps me out $10 a month or whatever the Lord lays on your heart. So if you're interested in becoming a partner, uh, you can text the word discipleship to 41444. Or head over to infaith.org backslash Dennis dash Sotherby. And if you have any questions or topics that you would like me to address on a future episode of Faith and Focus, why don't you shoot me an email? You can email me at Dennis Sotherby at infaith.org. Just put in the subject line, question for Faith and Focus or something like that. Uh, so I can see it, know that it's from you. And know that it's an issue that you'd like me to address.